speak on that topic just two months ago at our regular Monday night meeting. Yes, I'm filling in for one of our invited speakers from out of town who decided to skip Vancouver in his world tour. So uh, my friends say, OK, Philip, you have to fill the hole there. So I'm just the guy filling the hole. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, release planning, iteration planning, that kind of thing. Um, some of you may have known me in some previous life when I was uh, with Rational Software and then very briefly with IBM. Um, that was between, uh, I don't know, 1987 and uh, 2003, I think. So my retirement job is being a prof, you know, you know, they, I've reached my ultimate level of incompetence, you know. <laughs> First you do things, and then you direct other people to do things, and then you organize people doing things, and then you speak about doing things, and then you write books about doing things, and then you do guru speech about doing things, and then in the end you just teach undergrads, you know. So that's what I'm doing. Well, I, I keep an eye on the new folks in industry, and I do occasionally some consulting and training around. And the reason I'm here is with my uh, longtime friend, Steve Adolf, uh, whom you may have vaguely see passing by. He's pretty busy. I founded this uh, August uh, organization some five years ago. Uh, we started very modestly. He said, oh, you know, I have a friend. His name is Alistair Coburn. We should invite him. So we invite Alistair Coburn, and I book a meeting room for 25 people. And I'm glad I, in, my, in my invitation email to all the people we could find an email address from, I said, please RSVP. Well, after three days, we had about 90 people who had RSVP. So I had to find a bigger room. And then we had 160 people who had RSVP. So I had to rent an expensive room from SFU downtown. Uh, that was the birth of Advice Vancouver. Anyhow, you're not here to hear me about uh, speaking about history. I'm going to speak about a lot of other stuff. I'm going, to, I'm going to touch so many stuff that you'll feel you'll feel dizzy at the end. I'm going to speak about software development in general. This is my, you know, now that I'm an academic, I have to have some little theory about things. So, whoever heard uh, Mrs. Uh, Rising will have an hour. Uh, I'll speak about backlog. I'll speak about time box, features and values work and cost, and we'll speak about a lot about cost and value and the difference between those two things, if there is a difference. We'll speak about invisible features, dependencies, release, budget, estimation, or lying to ourselves now that we have a name, and effects, and technical debt. Gee, I didn't know what uh, Martin would speak about, so now I'm going to quote Martin Fowler. I even stole his slide in the meantime. While you're having lunch, I was <laughs> Isn't that agile? You know, I can quote the guy that I heard this morning in my afternoon presentation. So, at some point in time, you'll realize that uh, a black and white printout of this presentation lose most of the idea when I speak about colors. And if, I, if we have time, I'll speak about risk and uncertainties and the kind of research I want to do on software engineering with some crazy people. Some of them are even sitting in this room. Um, so, some people heard a strange message around 2000. They said, oh, this agile stuff, we don't need to do any planning. Uh, yep, let's just roll up our sleeve and let's do it, like when we were in school, you know. Uh, so, stop writing code and complaining. So, yes, I'd like to do some research on modern software development. Um, mostly on software project management. I'd like to do some, what physicians do, evidence-based software engineering. You know, look at real evidence in practice, rather than developing theories in a lab and trying them on a bunch of undergrads who don't know much about software development anyhow. Uh, so I'm looking at some of the agile practices, 
I'm sort of, a, although I'm the founder of Agile Vancouver, I'm an Agile skeptic, you know. I see a lot of things that looks like old stuff in new clothes. Okay, we don't speak about iteration, but we have scripts. We don't speak about productivity, we have velocity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit about integrating things, ideas from other disciplines. Um, well, in case you wonder, I'm a mechanical engineer. I fell into software at a young age, you know, in the early 70s, probably because I saw that this was where the money was. Uh, and, but okay. Uh, I have a few day tours in this presentation. So this is my first day tour. I'm going to speak about software development in a very broad sense. Uh, so this is not an XP talk or a Lean talk or a Scrum talk, or, but okay. So this four key concepts, like the intent, product, the work, people, and three that are used all across, attributes of the four of them. And for those of you familiar with UML, this is a UML diagram. Yeah, I know, I, you know, I'm with UML, like the fool with a tool, you know, anything I can see. <laughs> so intent, intent represents the product we want to achieve, the product realizes the intent. But so we see that there is a discrepancy. Well, the intent drives the work, and the work is what produces the product. And if we were to stop here, it would look like a factory. Unfortunately, we have the secret ingredient is that the work is executed by people. So actually, the people do the implementation of the product, not just the work. We cannot shove the intent into the big machine and it spits out the product at the end. And each of those four key concepts has a notion of time. The intent fluctuates over time, may have different level of quality and refinement. There's risk and uncertainties associated with the intent. And the intent may be your software requirement specification or a shopping list or your test if you're doing test driven development. Well, whatever you intend may be represented. So this model applies to a wide range of software development methods. Product, well, it evolves over time. We don't have the product in one shot, instantaneously. It will evolve over time. The quality of the product, okay, well, read ISO 9126 or all this kind of good thing to see the description of what the quality of the product is. Risk and uncertainty, there's a lot associated with it. Where process and project management is a subset of is the work. The work is the things that we have to do to transform slowly, gradually, the intent into the product. And they also, things are spread over time. And things are done with more or less quality. Refer to Martin Fowler this morning. And there is a lot of risk and uncertainty. And finally, the secret ingredient there, people, there's also issues of time, risk, quality. So the way you can put that together, the upper part here is what is facing the, the customer, the end user. You know, that's where the wishes, the need, the constraint come from, and the delivered product goes into that project environment, and there is some kind of feedback. You know, from the product, we look at it and we say, well, oh, this is crappy, this doesn't work, this is a defect, or wow, you know, this gives me an idea about some nice enhancement for version two or three, if you're still alive. And there's all kinds of other things, legal, regulatory constraints. We need to be SOX compliant and certified by the FDA and the FAA and TUFA in Germany and you name it. From below here, affecting mostly work and people, there are the technologies, the education, the experience of the people we bring. So that's the end of the day two, but I'll come back to that slide a little bit later. A software development project is basically what it takes to transform intent into a product, and what it takes is work. So if this is the amount of discrepancy between the intent today and the product that exists, or doesn't even exist because it's the first time we do it, and if we want to compress the time, we have a massive amount of work, or if we have a lot of time, we have nicely you know, flowing work that transforms gradually the intent into the product. And we've discovered that we cannot do that in one shot. This is called the waterfall. Um, we do it in small chunks. We take a little bit of the intent and we transform it into a little bit of the product. And 
we take more of the intent or we transform the intent and we transform into gradually more and more of the product until we release. So, backlog, what's the backlog? I stole this from uh, my code, Mountain Coach software. The product backlog is basically the long list of all the things we would like to do in order to transform our intent or the one we perceive at some point in time into the product. And because we want to do things iteratively, we take little extract of that and then we churn the stuff and we have our daily huddle and all these good practices which we won't discuss today. And it spits out something that resembles like what the intent was, the product. So the backlog, the backlog, we have all these requests of features. It would be nice if the product was doing this and was doing that, and by the way, it's a spec, and that. So we have this long list, and we need to assign it to people, and we do that in small chunks. So out of this, we're going to sort it out using various rules of thumbs and heuristics that I'll revisit, and we have a small bucket of the backlog that we're going to handle in the upcoming iteration. Oops, sorry, it's called Sprint now. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, okay, you know that all stuff. And the whole purpose of this thing is to tell you that the backlog is not blue. The backlog has these four colors. So we're going to go through the various colors in time. Another key concept behind this presentation, I'm oversimplifying here, is we have a tie box. This is software development. So we have time here and we have people. Remember, the secret ingredient, the thing that makes the work. I know there's compilers and regression testing, but all this stuff, we solved, we solved that part of software engineering last century. You know. there's, there's still now the, the key ingredient is people. And now I even know they lie, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we have stuff and we have time. Stuff, okay, I agree with you, it's not a straight line like that. It's usually a bit jagged there, but okay. You know, and, and there's a dip there when they go on vacation, you know, maternity or something like that, or paternity leave. Whoever has worked with Swedes here knows more about paternity leave than maternity leave. This is what I had to suffer with with half of my team in Stockholm. Anyhow, the surface here is what we can spend doing costs, doing work. This is the cost. Most of the costs are equal to paying your sumptuous salaries. Okay, we can have a little bit of you know, addition. We multiply that by 1.6 to pay for your fancy computers and the bills from uh, PC Hydro. And we know a lot of things about time boxes. We know that this time box is much better than this time box. That we have more time and less people, it's the same amount of work, you're going to pay them the same thing, it's much better than this one. You know, the first guy who wrote about it was Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man Moms, 1975, a book that each one of you should have read. Yes? Okay. Well, you can, you, you can, you can buy the 95 version where he has an additional chapter or two where he explained the few things where he think he was wrong. So, so the way it proceeds is we have time boxes one after another. We have a time box for release one, followed by a time box for release two, if we're still alive, and a time box for release three, and so on. So each one of them is a time box. And I agree with you, it may fluctuate because we may not have the same level of staff, or maybe they ask for more money, therefore they're more expensive. Inside the release, we're going to proceed by iteration. So it's the same thing. There's a time box for each iteration. Okay. Now, what are we doing in a given release? That's very easy. Let's look at the list of features. Yes, Mr. Product Manager, this is what we're going to do. That's the easy stuff, it's the green stuff. So those are the features. This represents the intent. Let's go and do it, all in release one. Uh, sort of, it may not completely fit. So if it may not completely fit, we have to rank them and decide where we put the bar. You know, so what's below the bar on my diagrams, I'm sorry, I don't think like, like my friend Steve Adol. For me, the, we do the bottom of the pie, not the top, okay. So we, we put the bar here, and this is what we're going to do. And this, well, dear product manager, you'll have to wait. We'll do it some other time. Yeah. We'll be done in release two. 
So we take that stuff and we populate the time box with it. Simple enough. We shove into the time box as much green stuff as we can. Uh, well, first difficulty. This is work, and it has cost. So we have to do some estimation of how much work is associated with that feature. Okay? Because our time box is basically our budget. How much work can we do between now and that release? Sure, you could decide about when to put the release and change the shape of the time box, but there's only so much we can play with when do we release. So how do we select what goes in the box? Not a big problem, you know, to populate the box, just look at the value. That's what every Agilista has been telling us. We need to maximize at every point in time the value we deliver to our stakeholders. If we need to maximize the value, let's put value on the green stuff. Okay, and we we'll solve things by value and we say, huh, you know what, the 12 there is big value, you'll get it, the seven, you'll get it. This little three and twos, bap, that's what we'll have to wait for. So it looks pretty easy, you know. Highest value first, we ignore time depreciation and all that kind of good stuff. So it shouldn't be that difficult to plan the content of a release. The first problem I find in a lot of organization is that they confuse value and cost. We may have a lot of things that have a lot of value. Maybe the cost of implementing them is not exactly proportional to the value. So now if I put a cost, and to make sure we're not mixing them up, this is the value and this is the cost. So I put the cost with a, a dollar sign. If I put a cost associated with each value, there's no reason they would spread be strongly correlated. Actually, on this tiny little example here, well, okay, the big value one had a big cost, granted. And this one, ah, yeah. But look, the seven, hey, it has a relatively small cost. So there may be stuff that have a low value to implement, but a deep value for you out there, my stakeholders. So value and cost are not necessarily well aligned. They sort of on a general trend, yes. But when you look at the scatter of the value and the cost, they're not exactly proportional. So when we confuse, when we say we want to deliver a lot of value, let's not confuse that with the cost that it takes to implement. The slides are available somewhere, but you'll know only at the last slide, so you have to stay to the end. <laughs> <laughs> So value is value to the business, the users, the customer, the public. We should ask them about the value. We should not ask the software developers what's the value of doing this feature or that feature. On another hand, we should ask the developers, the people doing the work, what is the cost of implementing it. So the cost to design, develop, manufacture, reproduce, distribute, install, support, maintain, and so on. Now, I agree with you in a in a large system that has been mostly implemented where you're only adding little things one at a time, value and cost are probably roughly aligned. But on a large complex level system for which there is no predefined architecture where you have to do a lot of you know, yellow stuff as we will see later on, value and cost are not exactly aligned. So let's not confuse it. So value is on the upper side of that diagram. Value is about the value of this intent and the value of the product when the product exists. Cost is doing the work and mostly actually paying the people. So the cost should be you know, evaluated by the people down there and the value by the people who are going to use the system, sell the system, market the system, pay for the system. It's a little bit the same difference. Um, that we have between the, the term effect efficiency versus effectiveness. When we look at efficiency, we're looking at cost. You know, what's the relationship between our output in terms of good service or the result and the resources, the money, that, and people, well, the people that we pay with the money, to produce that. So that's efficiency. Effectiveness is more looking at value. You know, for what I do, what kind of impact do I have on my market? So what kind of value can I deliver? Value. 
Oh, another little detour. Have you heard of a learned value system? Well, it has nothing to do with value, despite the name. It should be called differently. We should call it a spend cost system, not an earned value. Because this is what it's, it's about. Actually, the people who invented it acknowledge that, because this is various curves. They're called actual cost of work performed, budgeted cost of work schedule, budgeted cost of work performed. So it's not about value. It's all about cost and the cost that we have forecast. So that's the green stuff. Short lesson for now, let's not confuse value and cost, unless we are in a relatively simple system. Then there is the yellow stuff. We find very rapidly uh, that we cannot just list all the features. There's other stuff that we need to do when we are doing the software development. There's the yellow stuff. In order to do this green stuff, we may do the green stuff, but we have to have something on to which to hook it. Some stuff in the infrastructure, the yellow stuff. And maybe the $15 here breaks into $5 invested in doing the yellow stuff, and 12 and 10 invested in doing the green stuff, so that we can deliver 12 in terms of value. So those invisible features, uh, you, know, you can call it software architecture, design, infrastructure, the common elements, the framework, the library, the reuse stuff from the previous project. Um, DSL, Martin told me this morning, Martin Fowler, that he's writing a book on domain-specific languages. I know nothing about domain-specific languages, so I'd be curious to read it. So actually, the features, we have green stuff and yellow stuff. But we, the software developers, know about the yellow stuff. You know, the product manager and the customer and the end user and the guy who pays the bill doesn't know about the yellow stuff. He assumes that we should do the right thing, but that's about it. Moreover, whereas the green stuff can be often quite independent, especially on a large established system, you know, there's a lot of dependencies over the yellow stuff. You know, we, we can do this green stuff cheaply. We have this yellow stuff in place, and that's yellow stuff in place. You know, there's stuff that we can do when we have the right framework, and the people trained to use it, and the right database, and the right authentication system, and the right server. So there are dependencies. So remember, to do release planning, we have a time box which represents our budget, and now we want to fill it with green stuff and yellow stuff. And here we have a first tension. The product manager or whoever represents the customer wants to maximize the value and therefore the green stuff, not interested in yellow stuff. The project manager is interested in maximizing budget utilization. How can I best? fill my time box. And the tech is, like I was for many, many years as a software architect, I'm interested in maximizing the yellow stuff because that's where the fun is. You know, well, you know, there's plenty of time to do all the green stuff later on. Let's do the yellow stuff first. <laughs> so there's some tension there. Um, just focusing on the green stuff and doing what actually Ken Schwab, uh, not Ken Schwab, uh, Sutherland told me at a dinner just again two, two weeks ago, oh, we need to deliver value to the stakeholders right from the first iteration. Yeah, well, this is a big project that I was involved with. A project, not a small, little agile stuff. Um, basically, we're building a financial system from scratch using agile method. So that's a rough description of the system. Uh, replacing about two million lines of code with some equivalent number in Java, and all kind of good technology. <coughs> so they use a combination of XP and Scrum, have one week iteration, there are 30 developers, they're co-located, they have direct access to the end user or a sample of the end user, they do demos every week, rapid progress, early success. You know, it's really the poster project for agile developers. And then, they hit a <laughs> after four months, they cannot sustain one week iteration. Just the refactorings, as they call scrap and rework, takes longer than a week. Uh, so what I call scrap and rework ratio increased dramatically. There's no visible progress. Oh, sorry, there won't be any demo this Friday. 
uh, because we don't have anything really that different from last Friday to show you. The iteration now stretched to three weeks. The people start you know, pointing fingers at each other. This is not the way to do XP. Where the real XP would tell you, no, 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 this is because you're using Scrum. No, 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 no this is the wrong technology. Um, you know, slamming of the doors and people leave. There was a lot of mercenaries in the 30 to 50 people that didn't help. Um, so as a result, lots of code, no clear architecture, no obvious way forward. When I started to pronounce the word architecture there, they said, oh, dig up front design, we don't do that here. You know, it's <laughs> idiot. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, another little detour. Units of cost and value. Um, we've been very good at getting away from source lines of code or person days and things like that for the cost by using points, use case points and story points and that kind of thing. Um, this has given us some nice way to estimate relatively rapidly and not get bogged down into all kind of stupid arguments and things. But when we speak about value, people, for some reason, want to express value in terms of monetary value, dollars. It's very difficult. I, I remember having this endless argument. I worked on telephone switches for eight years at Alcatel, trying to put a dollar value or a French franc value at the time on every single feature that a switch would do. It's ridiculous. It doesn't work. Okay. So let's look at priority. High, medium, low priority. Well, the stupid dialogues I had with Rene Hang, I'm a good friend with him, you know, 30 years later. Uh, he was, oh, yeah, 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 I'll help you prioritize. Hi, 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 <laughs> hi, 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 no. I said, well, you know, that doesn't help, Rene. He said, well, I know you guys, you know, everything that's not high, you're not going to do it. So I'm just telling you, oh, you mean you don't need the one that you say is low? I don't understand it. <laughs> okay, so the DSDM folks have come up with something a little bit different, you know, must have, should have, could have, would have. It helps a little bit uh, between the high, medium, low, but still not much. So why don't we do with features and value what we've done with other things, you know, have some arbitrary unit of measure. So my friends at the SDI suggested the UT. Because we don't want to use points on both sides for cost and value. Otherwise, we keep the confusion. So they have this unit, totally arbitrary, called a UT. So you take an important feature and you say, this one is 100 UT. And then you rank all the others. Oh, compared to the master thing, this is a 10, and this is a 50, and this is a 90. Okay, And you normalize your UT. So it matches what we do in terms of point for cost. And you can have a, a sort of velocity in terms of value that you deliver by how many utils per release. <laughs> and actually, you can normalize it. You know, you, Once you know how many utils you've produced and how many points, story points, or whatever other points you're using, you can do a uh, division. You know, you can, how much dollar development did it cost us? And you can say, well, one point was so many dollars. And same thing on the value side. Yeah, this reminds me a little bit the kind of discussion I had in, in the late 70s, early 80s with our product manager. Uh, we didn't call it a user story, but uh, it was a little bit like this. I sent it to Pandey Hang, my product manager from the 80s, but I don't think it was the good. Okay. Uh, let's skip this one for now. So what color is your backlog? So we've seen that there's green stuff that's pretty obvious. That comes from the description of the intent. And there's this yellow stuff. So we have the green stuff, the yellow stuff, there's dependencies, and we fill the backlog with this. Some issues with estimation. We want to estimate cost. We've done some progress, but it's still you know, the the black magic in software engineering. How do we estimate the cost of them? Uh, at least now we, are, we have modest expectation and we try to do it again and again with a short window. But they're still at the level of governance and project management and portfolio management. We'd like to get a little bit of longer term estimates. 
One thing that uh, I found in several circumstances is when you start asking people about you know, how much would it cost you to do that or how much effort, if you ask them for one number, they, they protect themselves because they know, uh, they know that they have a tendency to be optimistic. But if you have generalized padding, you end up with humongous number, and then you say, oh, I cannot trust you, I cannot believe you, you're all cheating in some way. <laughs> so it would be better to have two numbers, you know, the ideal case, uh, and the worst case. Worst, not worse. Well, my grammar sometimes is uh, Bear with me, English is my third language. Uh, as my kids <laughs> used to say in Vancouver, excuse my dad, he's ETN. <laughs> Usually people ask, ETN? Yes, yes, it's English as a third language. <laughs> Anyhow, so there's ways out of that. Um, without making long theories, a gentleman called Elihu Goldratt wrote something about the theory of constraints, and he wrote a novel about it for people who did it the first time. Uh, David Anderson, whom I've invited uh, to speak here a couple of times, has exploited that. But, and bas basically what it ended up with create some form of a buffer out of the delta that there is between the ideal case and the worst case, uh, create some kind of a buffer so that we share across the team that buffer, rather than each one individually holding his own buffer. So what that means, that means for our time box, we're going to not fit. We're going to leave something aside. We, we're going to do the, the work estimate, and we're going to fill this, and we have this buffer. Share. Okay, anyhow, uh, green stuff done, yellow stuff done, and uh, we'll come back to it. Defect, that's the red stuff. So, a defect, I think it's a feature with a negative value. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it diminishes the value of your product. And interestingly, it still has a positive cost. <laughs> it would be great if defects had a negative cost. Oh, I'm saving money by having defects. There's a deeper count on the face there. Okay. Um, well, we know that it's all related to the place and time of discovery. There's the, the defect that we find in process, in house. They are relatively nice because we can fix them now in the next week iteration or something like that. And the one that escaped. The defect that have escaped and hit the end user and the customer, those are much more costly. Those are the rest. So outside development. Nobody wants to do work. Those are in-house and those are out-house. <laughs> so we could do the same thing actually. And we should. Uh, as uh, Described to us, we tend to sort of think that we're perfect. Actually, in our team, we won't have any defect. You know? <laughs> well, we will have some, and maybe we'll need to have also buffers in order to fix the in process defects. So, an escape defect has value. The way I could represent that this is the perfect product, so it's green stuff, and you get all the value. If there is a defect that's visible, that means you've eaten a chunk of it. So the defect is that negative thing that you've taken out of this chunk. They have both value and cost. The value of fixing a defect is minus the value of the defect. Okay? Because when I fix it, basically I turn this into green, and now I have the perfect rectangle. Defect, they have dependencies like the rest. They may depend on some yellow stuff architectural stuff, framework, you name it. So our nice little diagram here start to be a bit more complicated because we have the green stuff, the red stuff to schedule into it. Or would say the product manager, I don't want to hear about defects, you know, that's your problem, that's not mine. Uh, now we have a, a false party. Remember, the product manager is interested in maximizing the green stuff. We, the techie, love to maximize the yellow stuff because, especially at the beginning, this is where the fun is. And now we have customer support who wants us to only work on the defects, the uh, tensions. And the bar still has to fit somewhere because there's only so much work we can do. So the red stuff, that was easy. What's the dark stuff? <laughs> the black stuff. Well, it was supposed to be brown, but actually it looks like black. So. Yeah, it's the black goo, it's technical thing. 
I didn't know that Martin would speak about technical debt. Concept introduced by Walt Cunningham. You know who Walt Cunningham is? Yeah. I should invite him, actually. He promised that to come. He lives in Portland. It's not so far. If we have a little bit of money left out of this conference, we'll fly him over. He's the guy who invented the wiki. But also he invented technical debt. Well, he mentioned <laughs> <laughs> We can blame it on him. <laughs> like everybody's blaming the waterfall on Winston Wise, who didn't do anything wrong. If you read Winston Wise's paper, it's a perfectly paper with lots of iteration, and it's not as bad as people have depicted. Anyhow, Ward invented it, and he mentioned technical debt. Here in Vancouver, Uppsala 92, it was in Vancouver, it was the Hyatt. I was there. It was raining like mad the whole week. Um, anyhow, Steve McConnell had something not with the four quadrants of Martin. <coughs> Excuse me. But I guess this is where Martin got his inspiration. Um, there's uh, the type one, the unintentional, non-strategic. You know, lots of poor little design decisions. We are pushed by the schedule. We want to go to Whistler this weekend and all that kind of thing. So. And there is the international and strategic. We know we're going to take a shortcut. In order to get some stuff to market, we have to take a shortcut. So let's deliberately do something from a design perspective, an architectural perspective is wrong, we know it. We shouldn't put this stuff in a flat file, we should have a relational database, but we don't have time. So let's do it, and immediately after that, if we're not dead yet, we're going to do the right thing. <laughs> so, there's the short term one, the one that we expect to pay off quickly, refactoring it's called, it's called a large refactoring. Um, if it's in large chunk, it will be easy to track, but if it starts to be very small bit, we cannot track it. And then there's the long term one, the one where at the beginning of release 2, we said, yes, we should have had a database, but actually it works with the flat file and it's far more important to get to release 2 now. But we'll do it at really three. We accumulate such technical debt. We don't repay it. It becomes long term and we have interest. So I have to think about it some more. But uh, while you were listening to the next speaker, I picked this one from Martin this morning. Okay. Uh, I, also, I also can do quadrants. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let me explain. For those of you who do not see the implication of technical debt under yellow and green stuff, a little bit how it works. So we have that thing. It has a value of 12. It's a feature. We have choices, we the de designer. We can do uh, the green thing on top of the yellow A at a cost of 5 plus 15, that would be 20. Or we could do it on top of the B yellow thing at a cost of 3 at a cost of 16, so 19. Or we could just brute force, and it has a cost of 18. So when I look at that, hey, sure, let's do this one. Let's brute force it. However, however, maybe this is being a little bit too blind. Suppose there is another feature, which we may not do in the same release, but in the next one, where if we were to implement it on top of A, it would cost 5. Implemented on top of B it would cost 8, and implemented brute force would cost 10. Now, if I do the sum of my three alternatives, well, I start seeing that A is paying off. Having invested a little bit of yellow stuff, start paying off. Having invested a little less yellow stuff, doesn't pay much off, and brute forcing it, well, OK, yeah, well, we have a higher pay. <coughs> So let's suppose that we don't have to deliver this one and this one in the same release. So the first one, we're going to brute force it, because this was inexpensive. But the second one, now we sort of say, oh, well, let's do the right thing. Let's implement A. And then we have to retrofit the old implementation of this one. So it has a cost. That thing's free. And then we can implement the second one on top of it. Now, the total cost of doing this is 30, which is bigger than what we could have done by doing this in the first place, or even this in the first place. So it's all a matter of how much can I anticipate over the thing that I'm going to need, the 
in the immediate or not so immediate future. The delicate balance between how much architectural stuff and design stuff do I have to do now? So technical debt, when I look at it, it's like a visible feature, uh, an invisible feature, sorry, with a negative value. The value of my overall product is less when I have technical debt. Why? Because adding new features will become more and more difficult. But it's not visible. It still works. You know, whether I have flat files or a relational database, as far as the end user sees, you know, it does the same thing, the same response time. It's just that later, we, the software developer, are going to pay for it. So there is, in, in some way, some form of interest. The cost of adding new features is higher. If we want to retrofit what should have been the right decision in the first place, the lower right quadrant in, uh, in uh, Martin Kohler's uh, quadrant, um, we have some additional costs for retrofitting the old features. And it leads to increased costs forever. I, I was with an Italian company a few months ago, uh, and the management of the US company who had just bought them were really amazed to add an, a, a, a tiny feature would take them six months. There's, there's something wrong with it. Help us understand why it would take six months. Everybody agrees that this is probably a three-week work. Well, they had accumulated over 12, 15 years so much technical debt that doing any kind of small change was a humongous amount of work. And they, when I, they didn't know the term technical debt. They could describe to me all the things they had to do. And one day I said, well, this looks like technical debt. I said, yes. That's exactly, now you're putting a name on it. So, a lot of people who've been in large software project for a while can feel, but we don't know exactly how to handle it. So there's been different suggestions. Maybe we can have a buffer for debt repayment. And some organization actually, they do small iteration, and every five iteration, it's an iteration where they don't do any green stuff. They only do some black stuff and maybe some yellow stuff. So they, they, they skip one as far as uh, delivering additional value to the stakeholder. So hence we have the quadrant that I described at the beginning. Yes, Martin, I can do quadrants too. Positive value, negative value, visible, invisible. By visible, I mean visible to the end user, the external stakeholder. So, visible features have a positive value. The invisible feature, hmm, the problem, they have a positive value, but we have a hard time putting a value on it. Actually, the, the, the two people here, that's what they're trying to do as part of their master degree, try to find some strategy to put a value on the yellow stuff. This is a little bit more obvious. The escape defects, you know, they have a negative value and they have a cost. This is far more subtle. And because there's different form of technical debt, there's the lots of little cruddy things spread all around, or big, deliberate, massive stuff, and anything in between. So yeah, you hear, you know, Yagni, you ain't gonna need it. But if you were to have needed it, then it's called technical debt. Yeah, sure. Now you tell me. Well, you know, a little bit of anticipation would have so technical debt, for me, it's often the accumulation of too many yagni decisions. And again, it's this tension between the green stuff and the yellow stuff. And the big project uh, south of the border who hit the wall there, basically they keep repeating to everybody, bigger from design, yagni, last responsible moment, all these big mantras of uh, the agile team, and they ended up, after six months, having zero architecture in place. Just a lot of Java code that was doing fancy, demoable thing, but very difficult to continue the project. So, so far, we have now some of the black, oh, hey, we're repaying our technical debt in this week. You know, we have put some black stuff here. Uh, some here we've postponed to another meeting. But put them all together. Make the technical debt visible. 
Yeah, sure, the, the small little crud one, the type one in Steve McConnell's jargon, it's difficult, but the big deliberate ones, <coughs> make them visible, put them in the backlog with a cost and a price, a value. On large, long-lived projects, things are a bit more complicated because of the effect of time. <coughs> So we know that when we start a project, we start here full of hopes, and we start spending a lot of money, so we're going deep and deep in the red. And uh, here we start getting to sell our product, so money starts going in, but we're still in the red for quite a long time. And here we break even, and now finally we make some profit. Okay. Economy 101, well, great. And um, there's this concept called net present value where we can have some initial investment and then we have repayments for it and this. The key idea there is that uh, I better have a certain value now than postpone it. So because if I don't have it now, if I have just a promise of it, maybe its value will be diminished. So there is a depreciation of the value that we do not deliver. So if that thing is estimated as having a value of eight utils or 8,000 utils or whatever it is, it's true if you deliver it in this upcoming release. But what if you deliver it here or here or in two years from now? Does it still have a value of eight utils? Maybe not. Okay, maybe here it has 7.5 and 7 and 6. So on large long leaf projects, when we want to manage them and anticipate a little bit what's going to happen and not just be just focused on the upcoming sprint, we have to understand that some of the stuff that we don't that we defer, its value will diminish. Unfortunately, that's not what happens with technical debt. Technical debt piles up interest. The more we defer it, yeah, the more severe it will be. So that's also something we have to do. <coughs> Unfortunately, here we are on our own. You know, the product manager and the support people and all that, they don't care about your technical debt. We, we have done it to ourselves. And we have to have convincing arguments that you know, repaying some of the technical debt is going to help the overall value of the stuff. When Rational Software was embarked on a, on a big uh, hunt for acquiring all kind of software companies around the globe, people like me were sent to do some sniffing around. It, it has a proper name, so due diligence or something like that. But okay, it was basically going around various software teams and getting friendly with them and having a glass of wine when they're French or a glass of beer when they were German. And, uh, and then start to feel how much technical debt there was because maybe the product was running fine, but if the development was on top of very complicated, ugly stuff with no architecture and no naming conventions, and maybe there was a lot of technical debt. Anyway. So we have our four colors. What kind of tool support would I love to have to do that? Well, Strategy and technical planning. Here we're missing the version one and rally software development people to tell us, well, we have the tool. Well, not quite. Those tools, they don't seem to separate clearly value and cost. And I would really like on non-trivial project to be able to clearly separate the mechanism by which I look at value and the mechanism I look at by which I look at cost. Also, they very often do not uh, integrate dependencies between the thing that you have in your backlog. Your backlog is basically just flat. The dependencies are not visible, or we have to keep them in our head, or put little nodes about the dependency. And they certainly do not take into account the time. So when we're doing some long-range planning and some what-if scenarios, uh, that you'll basically, you're left on your own, and you'll have to build on the side some complicated Excel spreadsheet to start to see what's the impact of that. Um, many of those tools do not integrate the concept of buffer out of which we can take you know, some safety margin of work. Um, I'd like them to have a graphical user interface, hence my idea of colors. 
Um, so I, I was trying to convince the version one guy to, to look at uh, this presentation, but he had an emergency in all his, his wife has a little problem. So. Too bad. Uh, Rally software developer, I'm going to speak with them too, and I have a share order, so I keep an eye on that. It's much more than version one. So how would it work? Well, I'd love it to work like this. Actually, I would have a big touch screen, and I would be able to move things with my hands. And if I'm moving, uh, if I'm moving this one, the yellow one would move together because they're dependent. So I would really love to be able to do this rapidly, you know. And I would move them to various releases, and I would say, well, for this one I need a bigger buffer, and this one a smaller buffer here. And when I have some more, it spins out. The dependencies are satisfied. All the constraints do work. Um, and then when progress is being done, I can say this one done, and I would give the actual, so I would eat up my various buffers as they go, and I would see if my buffers sort of are completely depleted, and when they reach zero, something is going wrong with this release. <laughs> and uh, I would say, oof, this technical debt thing, let's do it in the next room. Yeah. <laughs> then whoop, I get some free room uh, in order to put this little thing here, fixing this defect. And I would really love to do it this way, with my fingers on a big board. And actually, my friends in Stockholm would see the same board, and they would interact with it and say, no, 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 Philip, we need to do the yellow stuff here. My next presentation, I have an animation of that. Actually, I'm starting doing research on that. I'm just, I'm part of a group of researchers. We've got some of your taxpayer money. <laughs> <laughs> Five million dollars together across Canada, and we're going to use uh, table stop surfaces and and big surfaces, vertical surfaces to do planning. And you know, I have an army of slave labor. Oh, sorry, grad students there. <laughs> if you're interested in that kind of thing, we can speak offline. <laughs> so the kind of interesting research topic can we allocate? value to the invisible feature? What's the value of the yellow stuff? What's the value of the black stuff? Uh, how do we determine the size of the buffer? Uh, by historical data, some people argue with me that the concept of velocity has in some ways integrated the concept of the buffer. Therefore, we don't need a buffer. Well, okay, I'm not sure. So what's the impact of time on unpaid technical debt? This is where I need you, because I want to do evidence-based software engineering. I won't have technical debt by running a project with two undergrads for, for three months. I'll have technical debt only when you've been at it for 15 years. Then I can look at you know, how did you accumulate the technical debt. So I'll be knocking on your door. I saw one of your colleagues who has a Minerva right now uh, speaking with him about that yesterday. It would be nice to do it graphically, the way I showed you uh, on the screen. So, out of all this, a few suggestions for project management, if that's what uh, keeps you busy at work. Um, I would suggest, if you are working on something relatively big and challenging, if there is a clear uh, interface with your external stakeholders as opposed to the development team, Try to separate the concept of cost and value. Avoid monetary unit. You know, try to play with value and the concept of utils, whatever strategy you, you use for utils. You know, we can vote on features with little colored dots, you know, and, and everybody gets 10 dots, and after that we count how many dots we have, and we do that with different categories of users, and we mix up the result. Man, maybe one dot is one util. Oh no, the product manager dot has a value of three utils as opposed to this uh, representative of the customer. So I don't know, you can find some strategies. Identify invisible features and make them more visible to all stakeholders. The yellow stuff. If we keep the yellow stuff internally as a dirty little secret inside of the software development team, sure enough, we'll be beaten up on the head by, I want more green stuff. 
And I read the Agile stuff. It says you must deliver value at every single iteration. Well, you have to sort of put some value on the yellow stuff and anticipate a little bit on future releases. And if you take the decision to incur some deliberate technical gain, make it visible. I think we, we software developers, we're punishing ourselves by having all this dark little secret inside the team that we do not expose internally. Uh, maybe you want to try this strategy, not have just one number for estimate, but have two. And look at uh, the formulas derived by Reinhardt and on how to compute uh, a buffer. And if you have multiple teams or multiple streams of development, have multiple buffers. And if you have three teams, uh, each one with its own small buffer, maybe you have a super buffer in case some of the three teams uh, go up. Yes, it would be nice to have that with some built-in tool support, but it's not rocket science to do it with the tools that we have. Excel and that kind of thing, they're still the best friend of the software project manager, I think. <laughs> Much more than Microsoft project. <laughs> Make the technical debt visible, especially the large chunks, the type two uh, stuff, the deliberate, how do you call it that for this morning? The intentional, deliberate, uh, Reckless, well, well, whether it's reckless or not, you know. Yeah. Once, you, once you've identified as technical debt, it doesn't matter that whether it was prudent or reckless, you know. Identify, we need to change this. And maybe as early as possible, before we start paying lots of interest. For the small stuff, let's try to repay it as early as possible. So maybe just in the upcoming iteration, or maybe as I've seen uh, that, that team doing, have some iteration that are just for that, for doing a little bit of yellow stuff and repaying some technical debt. So three kinds of buffer you could play with. And I'm not saying that each iteration and each release has all of the three kinds. <coughs> but one buffer to absorb your uncertainties in estimates, one buffer for the correction of the defects, the one that we find in process and want to fix in process, and maybe some for that repayment. So for instance, you have a, a first uh, release, maybe you have only the blue stuff in the first iteration. In the second iteration, you have something for bug fixing. And the last iteration before releasing, you have a much bigger buffer for bug fixing because there'll be an emphasis on more testing and some better testing and things like that, so you may have more defect to fix. Now at a later release, now you may want to fix some, repay some technical debt early, don't plan to do it late because it'll, it'll go away. So plan to do it rather early in the release cycle, but at the last minute, oh, we'll repay this technical debt, especially if you want to take advantage of it here. Okay, so plan to do it early. In short, manage all colors in your backlog. Very often people say, oh, we have defect in the defect database over there, we have the green stuff in the requirement management stuff that we share with the product manager. The yellow stuff, uh, they're in the form of post-it notes around my screen, and the black stuff is not written anywhere, but we all know about it. <laughs> so manage it all together, not in separate silos. And when you manage it together, uh, it becomes pretty obvious what are the trade-offs that we have, you have to do. So some people have tried to do that organize this stuff, not in the form of nice graph as I showed mm -hmm. to you, but in the form of tools. So this is a um, common open source tool called Track uh, that has been instrumented by the developers to support the black, yellow, green, red stuff. Uh, you don't see it very well, okay. Normally we can read, but that's an effect of this project. Uh, so it says, you know, prevent private networks, Anyway, they also added there's some strong yellow and pale yellow and some strong green and pale green and some strong red and pale red. So they added another dimension to uh, what uh, they had found in my, in my description. Um, the, the author of that, yeah, I, I vaguely know him. Uh, so, um, <laughs> Yeah, that's even 
illustrate a little bit the attitude they find from many developers, you know, is there probably, you know, dealing with a massive amount of technical debt and some yellow stuff that uh, is eating a lot of the green stuff, but, you know, uh, it's not, you know, it's not percolating outside, articulated in terms that can be understood in terms of cost and value and trade-offs and dependency and impact and depreciation. Another thing that uh, plays with that is risk and uncertainties. When we want to sort out our backlog, should we also take into account risk? Um, RUP or RUP, the Rational Unified Process, which was developed on the Oak, or top of the Oak Ridge shopping mall in the, in the 90s, uh, we were trying to push some of the yellow stuff early you know, if you have a lot of technical risk, let's mitigate your technical risk early. You know, let's bring in a new technology in, um, having some uh, unknowns about response time or performance or scalability. That's the stuff that you do in the elaboration phase. So it's something that you want to bring early. But curiously, when you look at uh, Carl Vigor's uh, prioritization strategy, risk was pushing things to the right of the calendar. So if you have features that are not very well described for which there is some uncertainty about the value, maybe you want to push them to the right of uh, your, your calendar. So up in my, uh, in my pile of stuff. So if you have technical risk, try to experiment with them early because if you, if you blow on a mine the week before delivery, there's no massive amount of uh, refactoring that's going to save you. Whereas deferring some features that are ill-defined, maybe this is something that you can postpone. And you could, it's, a, it's a general rule of thumb. It doesn't always apply. There may be things where you would say, in order to better understand this feature, let's prototype it. And let's show it to whoever is interested so that they can say, oh, yeah, now that you're showing to me, now I know what I want to. The icky wheezy effect that Barry Berg described, icky wheezy. I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> so risk and uncertainty can certainly and should have an impact on how we sort out a, a big backlog of green and yellow and that stuff. Architecture, uh, it has value and cost. The big problem of, uh, now I'm changing cap, I mean, uh, I've been very involved in the last 20 years in software architecture and this kind of thing. I think the main problem we have in software architecture is that we have no external visible value that's visible by the customer. And we have to find better ways to express what is the value of architecture. And while there is some truth in, you know, let's not gold plate the fantastic architecture and the perfect framework and not deliver anything, um, I'm very concerned when agilists say, we don't need any architecture, you know. You ain't gonna need it, uh, this is big up from design, this is massive documentation, a metaphor is enough. Um, I, it's probably okay for um, medium-sized projects that are mostly evolution on an existing platform, but for a brand new system, I'm not sure. Last responsible moment is another one, and refactor seems to be the answer to everything, but um, there are certain things that cannot be refactored. It's not just a matter of, you know, opening the right book uh, signed by Martin on how to refactor with Ruby. It just won't be feasible. So architectural activities, before we cannot, before, because we cannot show the value of architecture, and I'd like to help, but I don't have any magic wand there, uh, they are very often not given proper attention, and that's what's caused the, the failure of that big project I described earlier, the project in California. And also that was called large technical debts. Now I've seen a few other large agile projects where yes, they were able to scale the agile practices, but they end up with something that now is very, very difficult to report because they've accumulated large chunk of technical debt. So architecture still plays a role. Uh, when the novel is system, the system is novel, uh, yes, in some ways we will have gradual emergence of the architecture, but it has to be 
more deliberate. You want to make it emerge. So you have to do the right thing and pick the right activities and the right green stuff in order to force the design of the yellow stuff and therefore not incur the black stuff. And it needs, unfortunately, to be done early enough in development. I'm not saying, let's do all the yellow stuff for three months and then and no green stuff. So out of your emerging requirements, because they also emerge, you need to sort out what is the yellow stuff that we need to do and what is the green stuff that we could do. And look at their dependencies and sort of say, well, if we do this yellow stuff here, well, we'll be able to have a lighter cost for doing this green stuff and that green stuff and that green stuff, and then implement them jointly. A little bit of green, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of green. It looks a little bit if you want. And how much of the yellow and how much of the green? Well, it's subtle. I don't have a magic recipe to tell you how much. Probably about 20, 25% yellow stuff and the rest green stuff. At the beginning, and after that, well, you have also to do the red stuff, so. Anyhow, that's uh, <coughs> all I have prepared for now. Uh, after that, there's a backup slide, like all my references, showing that I'm a good academic and pay tributes to all the people. <laughs> 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 and here, including our friend, uh, Martin Fowler. <laughs> <laughs> and these slides, when everything goes fine, I don't know, there's a microlink problem, it'll go there. And on the Agile Vancouver site, of course. With a fantastic video of me, uh, you know, <laughs> speaking to you in ETL, English as a third language. Uh, that's the Christian Engineering Services frog. Why a frog? Guess. <laughs> my kids, well, I said, well, I'm going to create a company. And my kids say, oh, yeah, that a company must have a logo. Say, wow, well, okay, find a logo. So Zoe, my daughter, said, I do the logo. <laughs> so she goes and think about it for two weeks, and after two weeks, she comes with a frog. I said, Zoe, this is a frog. I'm doing a software company with your brother. He says, Dad, you haven't been a French teenager in a Canadian high school like us. We hear a lot about frogs. <laughs> so, yeah. My brother made it that as a uh, scalable vector graphic, but it's still Zoe's problem. <laughs> okay, that's it for now. Questions? Yeah. Uh, you two, you're not allowed to ask questions. Did you yeah. mention the Kanban board? Oh, yeah. uh, did I mention uh, your friend? Uh, did, oh, that's it. Oh, okay. Well, somebody else did the uh, implementation of colors. I forgot your name. Nicola. Chris. Chris Nicola. Okay. On which tool did you implement that? Uh, Redmine. Redmine. Yeah. Okay. I still need to bang over the head of version one and write it to see the colors there. Thank you. I'll be happy to see a demo when uh, this day. Right. So, yeah. Okay. I'm trying. Um, what else uh, I had to say? After my talk, there is some lightning talk in the ballroom, and I was supposed to tell you something else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old. I cannot remember something more than an hour and a half. So. Anyhow, it'll come back. Any question on this stuff? A lot of this stuff is purely experimental. You know, don't, don't assume that I've done that for the last 20 years. Any it's the truth then. The truth in software engineering, whether Doug Simaro. Yes, madam. Uh, request for some advice. I can see presenting this to my project manager, and I can hear him right now in my head going, well, we have four development teams, four types, four colors here. No, no, no. <laughs> what arguments it's, would it's you the do? same thing as storing them in different <coughs> repositories with different people, feeding the, the beasts. And you need to have a complete picture. If you want to do iteration planning, Pick the card on the rally software development thing about release planning and iteration planning. You need to have the complete picture. What I'm suggesting, have the complete picture and make through things, especially the yellow and the black stuff explicit. The green and the red is usually explicit enough. It's the yellow and the black. And use tools that allows you to compare between them. So have a uniform understanding of value and cost. Madam? Um, I guess to tie in. 
segue from your complete picture. Um, I'm a business analyst, and so I still struggle to how to actually do requirements within Agile. And so when I'm looking at your zipper model, for instance, um, I struggle with that with my project manager, where they really want to see the requirements done, you know, within each iteration, just dealing with those particular features in small chunks. And how do you actually do a decent architecture if you're not getting kind of bigger picture up front? Uh, as, as a business analyst, I would suggest concentrate on doing a great thing with the green stuff. But speak with the developers, understand their viewpoints, understand their question, understand where they're pushing back and offering you trade-offs. They might say, well, if we were to do this, and they have some ugly technical term full of acronyms, we could save on doing this. Can we postpone that? Try to, to speak more with them, rather than just saying, I'm pouring green stuff to you in regular intervals. Um, the red stuff, as it's expressed in terms of visible value, you'll probably have to get involved as a business analyst as to, is it a defect that's serious enough? What impact it has? Can we postpone something in order to fix it? What are the dependencies with other stuff? Probably the, the, the red stuff you can be involved. The black stuff, yeah, it's much more difficult. But Sorry, I guess my question is yeah. about which of the four colors I should be involved yeah. in. Is what would be an appropriate scope for requirements and when? Because I guess that's where I struggle with is that when I look at well, doing requirements within each iteration for just those features, oh, okay, you're not getting okay. a big picture. So expanding the green stuff from the one liner to the fuller description. Well, yeah, you'll need to be involved in the decision on how to sequence that and then sort of bring more fully fleshed requirement as they are developing the various iteration. <laughs> basically being at least one iteration ahead of the development team, but being responsive for answering questions uh, for the stuff they are currently doing. So you'll have a sort of window progressing where things are more and more refined and more and more detailed as you, as you progress. But how do you help them with determining their architecture up front if, you, if they don't have a big picture of what all the features are supposed to look like? Well, there's a difference between having a big picture of all the features would be and having them all described in all ugly detail. Sure, it would be nice to have the long shopping list and identify in the long shopping list which are the critical features, the one that the, the thing has its name from. You know, if you have a telephone switch, being able to pick up a phone and dial and have the other phone. Of course, that's useful. Having the, you know, call forwarded uh, on the secretary when I'm on vacation for more than three days, except on weekend when it goes to the Guardian, maybe this is not important at the beginning. So you'll need to sort out in your features which are the ones that are critical, and maybe there's only two or three. And those may need to be fully developed so that we can guess what are niche initial tentative architecture. And, but have a list of all the others and expose that list. And a good software architect should be able to sniff over your list and suspect that there are some stuff that may cause some difficulty. Also, it's not just about features. A lot of the difficulties in architecture are related to non-functional requirements, as people call them. Things like performance, and, which is and reliability, availability, and scalability, and other elities, and performability which is the EDT form of performance. So those also, you might want to sketch them at the beginning so that your architect can start sniffing around and feeling where there would be some difficulty. And then when your architect would pick one feature and have in mind what kind of performance or scale you want, or you don't want that with 10 simultaneous users, but 10,000 simultaneous users, then he or she would find Maybe we need to flesh out this one a little bit. I need to understand more. So yeah, it's not massive amount of requirement at the beginning, but trying to sort out in which order to do them. Uh, this would require a whole hour to discuss this one. Yes, it would. Sorry? Yes, it would. I agree. Other questions? Hey, Martin, I can do quadrant two. I can. <laughs> Probably the yellow stuff and the black stuff. Yeah. Uh, to me, it seems like it's probably an implicit decision to make on the fly when you're building the system. And it's probably not 
how do you find out what explicitly the yellow stuff is and the black stuff is that you didn't do? Well, if, if you're conscious that you need some form of a persistency mechanism, this is the yellow stuff. If you decide to take a shortcut and say, let's put it in a flat file, we'll solve that later on, yeah. then it's, you've created some black stuff. You've done a more modest yellow stuff, it has a cost, you've done it, you had to test it and all that kind of thing, but now you're adding a piece of black stuff at the top of your backlog there. But that's, if you recognize the black stuff, yeah, but most people do not recognize it. That's exactly the point. That's that was point. exactly the point Martin was doing when he was uh, saying this, this, this morning. We, we live with it. We know what, what it feels, but we yeah. don't explicitly identify it. We don't put a value nor a cost on it. Yes. And in some cases, it's difficult because it, it's spread all over. <coughs> yes? Well, I Sorry. know it's difficult in our organization because um, Agile is relatively new, and when you show the client, oh, well, we are doing some infrastructure, we're doing this and that, no, don't do that. Just, just do the picture. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe well, don't do it, but at least be <laughs> conscious about it and know what you're going to pay for not having done it. Right, exactly, you have to have a rational discussion about it. You know, it's better to drive with your eyes open than closed. <laughs> <laughs> Is it fair to say that yellow stuff that you don't do becomes black stuff? Yep, yeah, I have a line on this one. So what is legacy code then? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a general term for any software we wrote before last week that we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when does it start to be legacy as opposed to last week or last year's code? I don't know. And it's usually when, when, when we're not interested in it, we say it's legacy. And <laughs> when we want to show that it's going to be a major under, undertaking to change or it needs to be completely replaced and we create this fantastic framework. Maybe have a, a domain specific language. <laughs> and, we <write> <laughs> file, and then we have to redo the system. We replace the legacy system. Um, well, probably in legacy code, that's where you'll find a lot of technical debt. And the reason it's difficult to evolve it's because of the technical debt. I don't know. Probably. Well, I but there may be some fantastic legacy code that survived for a long time. The telephone switch I wrote in the 1970-something, it's still alive and it's still maintained. Once in a while, some random Joe calls my sister, Anne Crochton, in the phone book of Alcatel and says, Oh, Mrs. Crochton, I couldn't find Philip Crochton, but I suppose you are uh, your husband. I, I have a question for him about a piece of code he wrote in 1970. <laughs> but, okay, so obviously Alcatel has some value for that code because they keep maintaining it. So I, I don't know, but yeah, usually when the bad legacy code is the one that has a lot of accumulated technical debt that's probably only identified, and the people who wrote it and designed it this way they're long gone. Yeah. Philip, there is a question. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you, you talked a little bit about the, the codependencies between costs. So sometimes if you build a little more yellow stuff, your green stuff is yeah. going to be cheaper. But I think I can see there's also codependencies between some of the value statements. So if you have this feature, this one becomes more feature. Yeah. And you also mentioned that they change over time. But with lack of knowledge, they're all, all so uncertain. And so it sounds to me like um, you've got four kind of uncertain features. You'll spend a lot of time assigning numbers, and by the way, if you believe Linda Rising, everybody's lying because they want to build that or that. And so how do you, at what point do you stop trying to use an analytical model and just find you know, an intelligent group of people to Absolutely. talk through it? I'm not suggesting that we put numbers and evaluate alternatives and cost them. I was just showing you know, three alternatives, not that you would have to imagine all the, the three alternatives and really cause them to pick the one that's the, the, the cheapest. Because precisely it creates this effect that people become blindsided by the tool and spend an inordinate amount of time feeding the bees for very little value. Yes, having people who have some experience in this domain with this kind of development will get you much faster to a comfortable point than trying to do it the whole analytical thing. 
It would be good, however, to put a little bit of numbers on technical debt. I'd like to investigate it some more, but mostly to understand the phenomenon, not to create an analytical tool that will sniff out your code and say, so technical debt is 20,000 uh, utils of value or something like that. Um, yeah, I would agree in general that uh, experience and uh, a variety of experience uh, and uh, stepping back and uh, being relatively humble to paraphrase uh, Eugene Lisker about what we know and what we don't know and asking questions to other people and comparing things uh, would do much better than having some kind of a fantastic tool in which you want uh, alternatives and various costs. Actually, it's very funny when I, people describe to, to me uh, how people make decisions and say, well, to make decisions, you have to enumerate alternatives and enumerate the criteria and evaluate the criteria for each of the alternatives and combine that. We never do decisions like that, at least not in software. Maybe this is what civil engineers do, but not in software. We usually, based on our experience, we see one possible solution and we try it. And it's only when we get some resistance that we sort of say, hmm, this one is harder than we thought, and then we start looking at alternatives. <laughs> or if we are asked to put some alternatives, we say, I know that this is the one. Oh, we could do this, but these things, and this is expensive, and this won't work, and <laughs> because we, we know already the one we have. You know, look at the, the book by Caldwell, uh, uh, Blink? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gladwell, not Caldwell, sorry. I think that in software engineering, and I've been in relatively large systems like telephone switches, and air traffic control systems, and air defense systems, most of the important decisions they've been taken very rapidly, not enumerating alternatives and doing things in a very analytical fashion. Or the analytical stuff was done a posteriori to justify a <laughs> decision that was made in, in a few minutes by a few people in a room. <laughs> Okay, and we're done. Thank you for your...